Well, good morning. Welcome to those in the building. Welcome to everyone online. We're really glad you can join with us. Uh, I don't know what your favorite television program was when you were young. Uh, one of mine was a, a, th- a, a series called Kung Fu that starred the actor David Carradine, and he played Kwa Chao Kane, a young boy who was raised in a Shaolin temple and was an expert in the martial arts. And uh, I loved that as a kid, although it was always disappointing because you would wait for the action scene. And it always came at the end, and it was over in about five or ten seconds. So as soon as you blinked, you missed it. So the expectation um, was there, but it didn't quite deliver. But uh, Kwa Chao Kane was nicknamed by an old priest called Master Po, the name Grasshopper, because he was small, he was weak, he was kind of insignificant. And he would say, Grasshopper. And then he would come out with a, a, a wise saying. And one of his sayings was this, expect the unexpected. Expect the unexpected. And if you Google those words, you will find that celebrities and actors and philosophers and um, politicians have used it throughout the year. You know, when it comes to 1 Peter, he's not saying expect the unexpected. The very opposite. He's saying this is what you should expect. And we're going to look at that in our studies this morning. One of the best books I invested in is this one, One Year in the Book of Psalms. And most days I try and read a psalm and enjoy the little commentary alongside it. And this morning, uh, the little kind of commentary bit spoke about Dan Crawford. Now, Dan Crawford was a missionary. He went to Africa in 1889, came from our sort of churches, and he spent 30 years serving God in Africa. He translated the Bible into the language Luba Sangha, managed to do the whole of the Old Testament before he died, died quite young. And they placed a copy of the Old Testament like a pillow under his head when they buried him in the ground. And my reading this morning was Psalm 31. And the reason Dan Crawford came up is they reminded us of a problem he had. In Psalm 31 and verse 15, he wasn't quite sure how to translate this verse. My future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. And he had a bit of a problem. And if you picked up the Luba Sangha translation of the Bible and uh, you translated it literally, it would read this way. All my life's whys and whens and wheres and wherefores are in God's hands. What a great translation. All my life's whys and whens and wheres and wherefores are in God's hands. And that's what the Apostle Peter is saying in this chapter this morning. Expect, not the unexpected, expect persecution. But remember, you are in God's hands. And as you trust him, you can cope. Well, it's good that we can link our voices together. Well, we can hum. We can lift our voices together, and we can hum together, and we can sing together. And uh, not out loud, under your mask, you can hum. At home, you can sing heartily our first song. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice tender to me. The promise of His word. Put 
Well, and like the folks watching at home, uh, I can see your feet tapping. So you might not have sang verbally, but you are obviously enjoying the song. Let's link our hearts before we uh, have the kids spot and we'll um, commit our time to God. So let's worship the Lord in prayer, shall we? Lord, it is good to tell out, to declare your greatness, your majesty, your goodness. We know that the heavens declare the glory of God. And when we look up at the sky at night, we see the beauty of creation. Or in the daytime, we look at the sea and we feel the power of the waves. Or we walk through the forest and we just enjoy the scenery before our eyes. Lord, that causes us to reflect how great God must be. I know this week as I've watched uh, the robins in my garden just uh, reflecting on how they have a whole world that they're involved in uh, all the time that most of us never see. And yet you must appreciate it. You created, Lord, an incredible world, a reflection of how incredible you are. The creator God, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who can do all things. And Lord, we worship you this morning. Thank you that you have made us not just to be uh, insignificant creatures on this planet. But Lord, you have made us to know you, to enjoy you, to love you and to serve you. And Lord, as a result of meeting together this way today, either physically in the building or online, Lord, deepen our love for you and our desire to serve you. So Lord, thank you that we can tell out your greatness. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice. Lord, if we were to go through the blessings uh, materially, we'd be here for quite a while as we thank you for health, for strength, for food, for clothing, for shelter. But Lord, thank you for our spiritual blessings that we were chosen in Christ, even before the foundation of the world. Before, Lord, we were even a a thought in our parents' imagination. You knew us and you knew all about us. Thank you, Lord, that you have saved us in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that time in our own experience when these truths became real to us and we moved from darkness to light. We who had not received mercy are now uh, those who have received mercy and are part of the family, the kingdom, the people of God. Thank you, Lord, for those blessings that you've lavished upon us. And Lord, it's in our Saviour we rejoice. We don't rejoice in circumstances alone because they are constantly changing. We don't rejoice in people alone because sometimes they let us down. But you are a faithful God, one in whom we can always, always find something to rejoice in. Lord, thank you we can declare and tell out the greatness of your name. You are the eternal God. You described yourself to Moses at a burning bush as the great I am, the God who is always. You're not a God of the past. You're not a God of the future. You're not a God of the present. You're a God of all three dimensions and more. We cannot limit you for you are the always God the great I am. And Lord, we thank you this morning for the greatness of your word. Thank you that we can look into the word of God and it is like a bottomless well. We always draw from it something new, something fresh, something helpful. Lord, may that be our experience this morning. Give us, Lord, hearts that are receptive and give us wills, Lord, that will bend and change as you speak into our lives. As we bring you our praise, and we say thank you now in in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
Well, Penny, over to you for the kids spot. When I was in the Ooh. oh, I'm on now. <laughs> Chilly, but a bit of sunshine makes a big difference, doesn't it? Now, children, in your yellow bags, all right, you should have two, Boaz and Nathaniel, and in yours, three, and yours at home, if you've got them, funny jelly sort of things. Can you have a look in your bag and see if you can find them? They're sort of different shapes. Uh, don't squeeze it too hard. Just, just, just feel it gently. Isn't it odd? A strange jelly like have you got have you all got one? Have you got one, Joe? I think you've all got different ones, haven't you? Can you feel it? What does it feel like, Nathaniel? Squishy. Squishy and a bit cold. Well, inside your squishy bag there is a little tiny disc. Can you find it? A little metal disc inside. Can, can you find that? Yeah, got it? I'm sure the rest of you know exactly what this is and what's going to happen. Are you ready? What you need to do is hold it in both of your thumbs and give it a little click. And then hold, hold your funny little bag very tight and tell me what's happening. Hold it in your hands and tell me what's happening. What's happening, Joe? Thank you, Grace. I can't see you down there. <laughs> oh, there's a little voice from the floor. It's getting warmer. Hold on to it, Nathaniel, because your hands were cold when you cycled up this morning. Keep your hands warm. <gasps> Can you feel it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter? <gasps> is that a nice feeling? It is. It's lovely. On a cold walk. In a wintry wood, that's a lovely thing to have in your pocket. To keep your hands nice and warm. But can you imagine if that got hotter and hotter and hotter? <gasps> what would you do? Would you be able to hold on to it? No, it would get very uncomfortable. You'd have to drop it, put it down very quickly, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, today's bit of Peter starts off talking about fiery trials. Now, you're all right. It's not going to burst into flames, I promise, okay? It gets warm and it stays warm. But if it got hotter and hotter and hotter, it would be very uncomfortable. And that's what Peter's talking about, being extremely uncomfortable, not because you've got a hand warmer in your pocket, but because you're a Christian. And he says sometimes that's what happens. In fact... All the time, often, to um, <coughs> it can be quite uncomfortable being a Christian. I don't think in this country we really um, have fiery trials, but there are lots of places around the world that do, you know, where actually being a Christian is like being in the middle of a fire. It's so uncomfortable and hot. And Peter tells us to accept expect that. He says, expect, let me just read it to you. He says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery old deal that has come to test you as though something strange were happening. That's exactly what you should expect. Now, what would you expect to happen if I pushed this brick here? What do you reckon? What do you reckon, Boaz? This one's going to fall over. All of them? Are you sure? Do you think he's right, Joe? If I, if I push that one, they'll all fall over. Is that what you would expect to happen? I think you might be right. And you know what Peter's talking about this? He's saying, well, if you become a Christian, well, really, you should expect, expect to have trials and difficulties. It's one of the ways that you get to know God better. And it's one of the ways that you show to the people around you that you love God and you're going to stick by what you believe. 
Shall we see if they're right? If I push this one, do you expect the next one to fall over and the next one and the next one? Grace, what will happen if I put my hand there? What do you think? That these would fall over, but maybe not those ones. Should we try it? Are you ready? Are you ready? It's going to be a bit loud. Oh, it didn't work. Hang on, let's try again. Maybe they're not quite close enough. Yay! It did work. Now, um, some of you have got little bricks in your bags. You haven't here, I'm afraid. You'll have to see if you've got some bricks at home. Because Gordon and I thought there were bricks up here, and they're not. <laughs> Someone's borrowed them. If you've borrowed them, can you let's have them back? Um, but if you make some dominoes, usually you do it with dominoes, they all fall over. And that's what you would expect. If one thing happens, then the next thing happens. Now, a little bit later on, Peter does say, well, if you're a criminal, or if you're a murderer, or a thief, um, or if you interfere in people's lives and make a mess well, then you do expect consequences just the same, really. Things happen, and you, you end up getting punished, or you suffer. But that's not what Peter's talking about. He's talking about suffering for being a Christian. And it can be really, really tough, but he's got some good advice. Peter's given us lots of good advice so far, hasn't he? Well, I'm just going to pick out one or two of them. It says in verse 16 of our little passage from 1 Peter chapter 4 that we should praise God. That's one of his bits of advice. Praise God. Remember how wonderful he is and say thank you for being such a fantastic God. But he then goes on to say in verse 19, commit yourselves to your faithful creator. Now, let me tell you a story. When I was a little girl, I, well, I still have got a big family, but I lived in a town and all my aunties and uncles lived in the same town as well. And one of my uncles was called Uncle Terry. And we all called him Uncle T. Uncle T. And he had a big garage. And the reason he had a big garage was because he liked making things, not little things, big things. I remember when he made a car, a whole car. Oh, that was incredible. But then, oh, the best thing of all that he made was an aeroplane, oh, a real one, a real one in his garage. Well, it's called a micro light, so it's not like an enormous plane. But he started just with the bits and pieces and he read the instructions and he did lots of research and he very carefully put it all together. And it took him months and months. He did it with his son Simon and it got bigger and it got bigger until he opened the garage door and inside was a real working micro aeroplane. <gasps> And he said, would you like to get in, Penny, and have a go? It could only take one person. And I said, no, thank you, Uncle T. No, I don't know what to do with it, because I don't know how it's made. And Uncle Terry said, it's OK, because I made it. I know exactly how it works. I'll show you. And he could get in, and he could fly it because he made it. He knew exactly how it was put together, exactly how to make it work perfectly well. If it was a funny noise, he knew what was wrong. If it made a little bit of a judder, he knew which bit needed to be adjusted. And Uncle Terry was the maker, the creator of that microlight. And actually, he was the best one to fly it the best one to, to guide it. And do you know what? I think that's what Peter's talking about. Peter's saying here, actually go to your creator, the one who made you, because he knows you best. Even when things are really tough, maybe a bit uncomfortable, expect it. 
it's going to happen. But go to your faithful creator. Faithful because he's never going to let you down. Faithful and a creator. He made you. He knows exactly what you like. He, what you're like, he knows exactly what you need. And then Peter's last bit of advice is to... He's already, he said it already once, at least once. And it's the same as 1 Peter 2 and verse 12. And it says, continue to do good. Live good lives. Do you remember he said it way back in Peter 2? He said, live such good lives that the people around you will praise God. Do you remember that bit? It was a few weeks ago now. So Peter's advice when you're suffering for being a Christian is to praise God and turn, commit yourselves, give yourselves totally to your faithful creator because he made you and he knows exactly what you need and to live good lives. Thank you very much. See you next week. That's all right. Just leave it. Thank you. And parents, now you know what to do this afternoon. Build yourself a micro light, okay? That'll keep the kids amused, won't it? We're going to read 1 Peter and chapter 4. I will pop it on the screen. If you have a Bible, you may uh, want to turn and follow it. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. And I'm going to suggest that those in the building, if you want to, you can stand up and uh, we'll read a verse each. So I'll read a verse and then if you can read a verse. So I'll start. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come to you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And all the people said, Amen. 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 Please be seated. I'm going to invite Hannah and Rosie up who are going to sing to us. And uh, we're going to enjoy, there is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, precious lamb of God, Messiah, holy one. So we'll pop the words on the screen and uh, those at home, you'll be able to enjoy the musicians as they play and sing with us. Thank you. 
it won't be long and we'll be able to vocally join in and uh, sing our hearts out in a few weeks' time. Uh, you folks at home, you've been able to do that this morning. In fact, I shouldn't say this, but the church I was in last week, they all sang anyway, but uh, shame on them, shame on them. Now, fiery trials, 1 Peter chapter 4, we're looking at this in our studies, and uh, it's good that we can focus our thoughts this morning on chapter 4. And then we've got two more studies in 1 Peter, and then it's Easter. So we'll have four Easter messages, and then we'll look at uh, a brand new series in the book of Acts. So exciting things ahead. But this morning it's 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Fiery trials fiery trials. Now, persecution of Christians around the world has actually increased during COVID-19, the pandemic. Uh, Many Christians have been refused aid and medical treatment simply because they are believers in Jesus Christ. And according to the the 2021 watch list compiled by Open Doors, more than 340 million Christians, that's one in every eight Christians, One in every eight Christians face high levels of persecution and discrimination because of their faith in Jesus Christ. That is a 60% increase over the previous year in the number of Christians killed for their faith. And more than nine out of every ten who have been killed have been based in Africa. So we live in a dangerous world, a dangerous world. But ever since the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, who was the very first Christian martyr, persecution and Christianity have kind of gone hand in glove. They're kind of Siamese twins. And for many believers around the world, it is the norm to experience persecution. In our country, it tends to be the exception. But for many people around the world, it is the norm. I guess there's not one single person in the building who would like to suffer. If you do, then you need to seek medical attention very quickly. Human nature says, no way, Jose. We want an easy life. We don't want to suffer if we can help it. But more and more, even in the UK, as Christianity is marginalized, suffering and persecution is coming our way. And uh, I watched uh, the lady from Christian Concern give a talk last night on Zoom. And uh, persecution and discrimination are very much on the agenda. And if you are a Christian, you know, especially if you work in uh, certain occupations, health, education, the media, government, you cannot speak up about Christian values. You cannot say something is wrong that goes on in society and expect to keep your job. You will lose it if you speak out. And even if you share your faith by offering to pray for someone, you can lose your job and maybe not find a job again in that particular sector. And even now, um, there are three speech laws taking place in Scotland, and if it happens in Scotland, it will happen here, about what we can and cannot say, what we can pray for, and even what we can't pray about that are taking place. And you only have to look in the Christian press and you'll soon realize the things I'm talking about. So persecution's coming. And people of my age might get away with it. But you younger folk, that's something for you to look forward to in life, isn't it? So we got rid of COVID and next is the persecution. Peter says, don't be surprised. In fact, he says, welcome it. Welcome it. In fact, earlier on in the letter, he's been talking about normal persecution. I love that expression, normal persecution. It's a bit like saying someone's a little bit pregnant. Oh no, no, you're either pregnant or you're not pregnant, aren't you? You can't be a little bit pregnant and you can't just have normal persecution and special persecution, can you? Persecution is persecution. But no, that's what Peter says. Earlier on, he talked about persecution, sufferings that everyone, Christian and non-believer, face in the world. But now he talks about a specific type of persecution just for Christians. And he describes it as a fiery ordeal, a fiery trial. The type of trial that comes because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Now up until this point in church history, Christianity has been tolerated by Rome. They kind of considered it just a sect of Judaism. 
And the Jews were permitted to practice their faith freely. So Christianity was allowed. But that attitude was about to change. And the fires of persecution are about to be ignited. First by Nero and then by other emperors who would follow him. And in response to this fiery ordeal, the Apostle Peter gives four instructions. Here's the first one. He says, expect ordeals, verse 12. Expect ordeals. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. If you live in a fallen world like we do, a world that is warped by sin, a crooked world, and you are trying to walk straight, you will stand out. We are swimming against the tide. There used to be a t-shirt that Christians could buy in Christian bookshops. You may still get it online. Of a whole group of fish swimming in one direction. Sharks and piranhas and, and fish with big teeth going that way. And then the Christian fish symbol swimming in the opposite direction. And of course it was making the point we are swimming against the tide. And just as if you get in your car and drive on the wrong side of the road, you are going to hit someone or have an accident or be in big trouble. If you break the, the laws of the, the road, you'll, you'll be in big trouble. And if you break the laws of your society, your culture, then expect a collision, expect a bump, expect a backlash. And that's what Peter says to these Christians. But we look at persecution negatively. Oh, woe is me. But actually, if you look at it from God's perspective, God can use even persecution to work good. You remember the story of Joseph in the Old Testament when he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God can turn a situation around for our good. Let me show you a little video clip, and uh, hopefully it illustrates that particular point. Excellent. That was a monarch butterfly colon escaping from its cocoon. And uh, I was reading this week about a man who was watching one of those uh, live before his very eyes. And he could see that the butterfly was struggling. So he got himself a standing knife from his tool shed and he just very carefully slit the cocoon so that the butterfly would have help in escaping and wouldn't be imprisoned in the cocoon. But sadly, when the butterfly then got out, it hadn't got strength in its wings to fly away. And it just fell to the ground before him. And he realized what a fool he'd been. In trying to help the butterfly, it actually hindered it. Because it is the struggle that forces fluid from the body into the butterfly's wings that then allows it to fly away. Without the struggle, it dies. It dies. And in a similar way, God uses the struggles we face in life to build us up in our faith, to build character, to build reliance on him so that we can handle the difficulties and we grow through the difficulties and we don't die. We grow spiritually. So first of all, Peter says, expect 
fiery trials. And God can use them for your good. You won't enjoy them. Nobody would in their right mind. But it's not the end of the world. What people mean for evil, God can turn for good. Secondly, rejoice in suffering. Verse 13 to 14. Rejoice in suffering. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. So that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. It literally reads, be constantly rejoicing. And if you look at verse 13 and 14, he mentions the word joy four times in one form or another. Three times in verse 13, rejoice, be overjoyed, blessed or happy are you. And then once in verse 14, you are blessed or you are happy. So four times in those two verses, our response to suffering, he says, rejoice, rejoice. Why are we blessed? It seems a contradiction. Suffering, joy. No, suffering, misery. Joy, ease. But to have suffering and joy together, that's a contradiction, is it? It's an irony. But not according to the New Testament. They are Siamese twins. They go hand in hand, hand in glove. Uh, when I had my market storm, and if you know that, when I first moved into the area, for about 10 or 12 years, I sold uh, second-hand books and Bibles at Ferrum Market. It was a form of witnessing and making contact with people. And uh, when I had my market stall, I had a, a request from a man in Chichester who said to me, whenever you get this book, I want every single copy of it. Don't sell it to Joe Public, save it for me. And when you preach in my church, I'll buy as many copies as you can. And the book was by Dr. Paul Wilson Brand, CBE, called Ten Fingers for God. Ten Fingers for God. He was a specialist uh, in, in surgery and in leprosy, and especially to do with people's fingers, their digits. In another one of his books, The Gift of Pain, he writes these words. This surgeon who deals with leprosy and people who have lost fingers and, and their fingers are rotting away and he helps them through their suffering. He writes these words. I have come to see that pain and pleasure come to us not as opposites, but as Siamese twins strangely joined and interwined. Nearly all of my memories of acute happiness, in fact, involve some element of pain or struggle. Have you noticed that if you ever pick up a Christian biography or even flick through a hymn book and you read these great hymns, you never read a great man or woman of God say something like this, the deepest and rarest and most satisfying joys of my life have come in times of extended ease and earthly comfort. You never read that. And those hymns weren't born out of ease and earthly comfort. The great men and women of faith that we look up to are those who often suffered in one way or another. And that's why the Bible talks about joy and suffering side by side. And in these verses, the apostle gives us several reasons we can handle those fiery trials. Notice he says, our suffering means fellowship with Christ. Verse 13, our suffering means fellowship with Christ. Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. You know, often when we've had baptisms over the years, and we sing the song, All I Once Held Dear. And that is based on the, it's a paraphrase of Philippians and chapter 3. And one of the lines says this, to know you in your suffering. And we sing it glibly and happily and heartily. But do we actually want to suffer alongside Christ in his sufferings? It's based on Philippians 3.10. The fellowship of his sufferings. And Peter says exactly the same in this chapter. To suffer for Christ is a gift from God. Not every believer grows to the point in their Christian life where God can trust them with that kind of experience. But Peter says if it comes your way and God trusts you with it, accept it, embrace it, 
because you are suffering with Christ. Joseph's son was a, 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 a Romanian um, man who suffered for many years in prison. He stood up to Nikolai Ceausescu's repression of Christianity. And one of his books, he writes these words. This union with Christ is the most beautiful subject in the Christian life. It means that I am not a lone fighter here. I am an extension of Jesus Christ. When I was beaten in Romania, he suffered in my body. It is not my suffering. I only had the honor to share in his suffering. Incredible statement, incredible witness, incredible man. But that's what the apostles believed, isn't it? Remember those words of the apostle Peter who lived out this truth in Acts chapter 5 verse 41? The apostles left the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Why? Because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. So Peter's not saying, this, you know, do what I say. He's saying, this is what I did. Learn from it. Our suffering also means glory in the future. That's verse 13, the second part. Our suffering means glory in the future. So you may be overjoyed when this glory is revealed. Think of suffering a bit like giving birth. Now I know for us fellas that's hard, but if you were there you probably still got the scars in your wrist where the nails dug in, just as that constant daily reminder. But Jesus used that teaching in John chapter 16 about a lady who's pregnant, but then she gives birth. And although the experience is painful, horrendous in many ways, I had to put earplugs in to drown the screaming out. Only joking. It's a horrendous experience, but the pain is forgotten when that little bundle, that little baby is placed in your hands. And I remember holding my kids with their head in my hand and their bodies just lied along there. And you hold them and all the pain's forgotten. I'm sure you felt the same way, didn't you, Ben? <laughs> hey, suffering's like that here and now. It is hard, but one day we'll be in glory and we'll forget the pain to embrace the joy. And then verse 14, he says, our suffering brings to us the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You want more of the Holy Spirit? Suffer. That's what Peter says. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. He is glorified. So you want more of the Holy Spirit, says Peter, Draw close to God in your times of suffering and you will experience him afresh in a greater way. So he says, secondly, rejoice in suffering. The third thing he says is examine your life, verses 15 to 18. Examine your life. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed but praise God that you bear the name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Examine your life. In fact, there are several questions we can ask ourselves when it comes to our lives. Verse 15, why am I suffering? In fact, verse 15 says, ask yourself the question, maybe you're suffering because of your own foolishness. If a Christian commits a serious crime and is caught, then obviously they will suffer because of their actions. He says if a Christian is a meddler, a gossip, an interferer, an annoying person, then don't blame God for your suffering. You've brought that on yourself. Examine your life, says Peter. Ask the question, verse 15, why am I suffering? Is it legitimate or have I brought it upon myself? Verse 16, he asked the question, am I ashamed or glorifying Christ? Am I ashamed or glorifying Christ? If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in this matter. 
You know, there's only, the, the word Christian is only used on three occasions in the New Testament. We forget that. We assume it was a common word, but it wasn't. Used three occasions. The first time in Acts 11.26, a term of derision, a vulgar word, just a put down. You're a, a Christian. The second time, it's used by King Agrippa in Acts 26.28. Again, used in a scornful, derisive, and mocking attitude or, or way towards the Apostle Paul. And then the third time it's used is again, uh, uh, the third time the word's used, once again, the context is not favorable. The suggestion is that when people know you are a Christian, you better expect trouble. It's like a red bull, a red rag to a bull, that word Christian was in the days of the New Testament. And Peter's advice is twofold. Negative, not be ashamed. Positive, glorify God. That's how we respond. Negatively, not be ashamed. Positively, glorify God. One will counterbalance the other. If we are ashamed, God won't get any glory. But if we glorify God, then we won't be ashamed. And then the third question he asks, verse 17 to 18. Am I seeking to win the lost? Am I seeking to win the lost? What will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? In other words, if God sends fiery trials or allows fiery trials on his people who are saved, what about the fires that will burn on those who aren't saved? What about the lost? There's a judgment coming says Peter, as does the New Testament, as did Jesus. We need not face the judgment because he has faced it for us. And in a five or ten minutes, we'll be having communion. And we will remind ourselves as we take the bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Christ were shed. He bore the wrath of God so that we don't have to face it. Find forgiveness and freedom. But if we reject that offer of forgiveness... And don't blame God. If you said, not my will be done, God will say, okay, your will be done. And you die in your sins, and you are separated forever. So Peter says, am I seeking to win the lost? Do I have a heart for those who know not Christ? And then fourth and finally, he says, commit yourself to God, verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This is the only time in the New Testament where those two words are used together, that title, faithful creator. If our creator, the one who made us, is controlling us and leading us and guiding us, then we can trust him even in those difficult times to keep leading and guiding and sustaining us. And the word commit or entrust is actually a banking term. It means you deposit something for safekeeping. Whereas Alistair might keep it under the mattress, you don't have to. You keep it in the building society or the bank and you know it is safe. And that's the word Peter uses here. That according to God's will, we are safe. We have committed ourselves to his safekeeping. And even if they kill the body, they can't kill the soul. So when we deposit our lives in God's safekeeping, we are confident of his reliable and trustworthy character. He is faithful, even when I'm not. And Jesus himself, of course, used that word committed. Remember as he hung upon the cross? He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And you and I too, likewise, we commit our lives into the safekeeping of a God who will not abandon us or let us down, who has promised, who has promised in his word that we will be with him forever. So, verse 12, expect ordeals. Verse 13 and 14, rejoice in your suffering. Verse 15 to 18, examine your life and ask yourself some questions. And verse 19, continue to do good and commit yourself 
to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words. They go against our natural inclinations. We want a life of ease. Uh, We want a life of comfort. We want everyone to like us and pat us on the back in a good way, not hit us with a fist, not um, ostracize us from their groups, not mock us for our beliefs, not humiliate, uh, use language that derides our God. But Lord, help us to get our minds focused on you and help us, Lord, to have a heart for those who hurt us, to bless those who persecute us, and to show love in return for hate. So apply these truths, these words to each and every heart, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Of course, in chapter 2, Peter's great example of how we handle persecution is the Lord Jesus, the man of sorrows. Let's sing that song, or let's listen to that song as we focus our thoughts ready for communion. Sorrows let my God by his own betray the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. The sun sets free, oh it's free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled.
Well, communion, there's nothing special in the bread. It's just bread. And there's nothing special in the juice. It's just juice. So whether you have it in that form or you've got it in your little capsule form that will come around in a moment, um, they're not magical ingredients. It is an act of faith. They're symbols. They're just reminders. Something solid, Jesus had a body. Something liquid, Jesus had blood. The important thing is the act of faith. We take it because we believe. He is our Lord, our Savior. And if you haven't got that confidence, then the Bible says best not to take it because you bring judgment on yourself. So it's not a game. It's for those who love the Lord, those who are seeking to follow the Lord and obey the Lord. And if you're a Christian, you're seeking to follow the Lord, you've trusted him, then you're welcome to take the bread and the wine as it comes round in the capsule form. There are two layers of plastic. The first one comes off and there's a little bit of bread like a wafer and then the second one will come off for the wine. It's funny how things strike you, isn't it? Um, I love John 3.16. I preach on it often. I, in fact, I've got a meeting on Saturday night where I'm probably going to preach on John 3.16 for my quarter of an hour slot in that meeting. And I heard someone speak on it this week and they said something that uh, struck me. Because I would often quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And sometimes when I'm with children or on camp with young people, I said to them the, the classic statement, do you know what? You can actually put your name in John 3.16. So it reads like this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that Gordon Curley believes in him, shall not perish, but Gordon Curley can have eternal life. And maybe you've done that. And the person I was listening to said, oh, I couldn't do that, because he had quite a common name. And he said, supposing there was more than one Gordon Curley in the world, I would never be sure that I'm the Gordon Curley mentioned. <laughs> well, I've Googled my name, I'm the only Gordon Curley. So maybe I can carry on quoting that. But some of you have got quite common names. And there's more than one Penny Curley or Alan Picard or Rose McCann in the world. And if you put your name in and you read it, could you be sure you were the one? But of course, the point he was making is this. The fact he says everyone is all-inclusive. Even if there's 20 Gordon Curleys or 20 uh, Colin Howards, it doesn't matter. If by faith you put your trust in Christ then you are saved. And as the fact that you are saved and seeking to follow him, you are welcome to take the communion. Let's give thanks for the bread. And then Alistair, if you're able to take it round, that would be great. Lord, thank you that you know us by name. We're not just a bunch of sheep, a group of human beings. You know us by name. You know the, the amount of hairs that are upon our head. You know every time we stand up and sit down, such as your concern and love for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord, that you saw us in our need. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord, for that time in our experience when we responded to that, that good news. We knew the wages of sin was death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And what a difference it's made. And as we seek to follow Jesus, we remember him in the way he asked us to. We take this bread now and we give you our thanks. Amen. Jesus took bread, he broke it. He said, people will tear my body apart. So you do this in remembrance of me. So when the sachet comes, let's hold it and then we'll take the bread together, shall we?
It's interesting to hear the tear of the plastic. The tear of the plastic. You know, there was noise when Jesus broke bread because it wasn't a nice soft loaf like this one. It was a mat sauce, which is a bit like a giant cream cracker. So it would have snapped. And they would have heard the snapping when Jesus said, this is my body, snapping, breaking for you. Let's take the bread, shall we, as Jesus asks us to do. In the same way Jesus took the cup, just red wine, but of course, symbolically, looks like blood. And he said, just as I'm pouring this wine out, so my blood will be poured out for you. So take it, drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks for the cup and then we'll drink it together, shall we? Lord, we thank you for that precious, precious blood of Jesus. Your word tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. The greatest thing we have is the gift of life. And when our blood is shed, that life is taken. We thank you for the eternal Son of God who shed his blood upon the cross, bringing us eternal salvation, eternal forgiveness. Lord, receive our thanks. Amen. Let's drink together, shall we? We reflect, let's listen to a song. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Who is love will not remember Who can cease to sing his praise He can never be forgotten Throughout his eternal days On the mount of Christ Fiction fountains open deep and wide through the flood gates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love. Let's conclude our time together, shall we? Let's say the grace. Shall we stand and say the grace to one another? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. Please be seated. You're free to chat on the car park. No problems at all. And don't forget tonight we've got our Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, come, come and join us for our Zoom prayer meeting, 8 o'clock. If you haven't had details, have a word with me afterwards. I'll make sure they are emailed to you. So we look forward to that tonight at 8.